This video series that we're working on here is about how skate parks actually get made. And that is through all steps of the process. We are at the Encinitas Skate Plaza, which most people refer to as Poods Park. And you can see we're at the entry right here to where uh, a lot of people stage and start hitting some of the plaza areas. And on the far side down below, we have the bull, which is also a very popular clover. And let's go check it out. So this project was over 10 years in the making by the time we got involved to work on this project. Challenges here is that it's not just a skate park. The whole project was part, you know, the fields and the playground. The challenge was the community only really signed off on a, a much smaller skate park as part of the approved master plan. We knew we had more land and the city was willing to work with us on making it bigger, but how? And the solution was not necessarily trying to make this a quote unquote skate park. Um, if you look behind me, there's like very subtle elevation changes that are actually ADA accessible from the outside. So we called it a wheel friendly plaza to the skate park. So that way it went from about 30 13,000 square feet to 32,000 square feet. The point is, is that the city legally could not make it any bigger than 13,000 square feet. Otherwise, they'd be back getting sued for another 10 years. No one in the community really wanted this park here who, who was adjacent to it. It wasn't just about the skate park. They didn't want any park here. To avoid triggering more challenges and lawsuits, you really couldn't violate the approved EIR master plan. So to do that, we had to make a plaza that you could just legally ride in. No different than, you know, some of the famous popular skate spots that you would see uh, from Love Park to Pulaski to, you know, the OG EMB Justin Herman Plaza. So that was really the inspiration for this. So once we shared that with the community of skateboarders, they loved it because the more authentic this looked, the better for them. So a lot of the things you're seeing here are sort of reminiscent of spots that people really grew up skateboarding that were no longer necessarily accessible or really not in a place you could just publicly ride and not have to worry about looking over your shoulder and thinking about getting a ticket. And the secret, I think, was when people say, hey, we want to be able to film here and make it not look like a skate park, less is more is the answer. The more you think you should have put in here, the more we were pulling out. Because if you look at a skate video and watch people skate a real skate spot or a plaza, the amount of room they have between spots is huge. You know, you're pushing, you're cruising, you're setting up, you're popping, you're landing, you're compressing, you're getting back up again, pushing again. I mean, that's like 60 to 80 feet easy, right? So when you're looking behind us, you can see all this space between this hit and the ledge and the volcano, which is pretty much the only transition in here because again, we had to make it look sculptural and authentic and natural. So if we had anything that looked too much like a quarter pipe transition, it was nixed because they're like, no, this is gonna look like a skate park and we're gonna get, we're gonna get pushed back from the community. Sometimes the challenges you have actually end up making a park better or you know what it's intended to be. All the colors and inspiration that you see in here wasn't necessarily all from the skaters, it's actually a lot from the community. As people may or may not know, Encinitas is a very eclectic art artistic community. And so that sundial over there around that volcano was um, actually inspired by local artists who lived in the community saying, we, if we're going to do this and we're going to sign off on this, let's make it look like it belongs in Encinitas. You know, we're all about art and culture and colors and vibrancy and the beach culture and our heritage of, of San Diego. So what we heard from the local skateboarders and I'll just go ahead and throw JT Pulford in the mix because he was one of the guys at the meeting and we've talked about this since then. He was actually pretty upset that it took, you know, over 10, 15 years to actually get this to happen. So they're so focused on what they didn't have that it's hard to get everyone understanding like, hey, let's pull everything together and figure out what we want because it was just getting to the point where we were gonna sabotage ourselves and that's a really imp important part of skate park advocacy. No matter what the drama was, or challenges were or even are, uh, how do we like overcome those challenges and push through it and not focus on that and just focus on getting what we want in here and getting it done. So all the way up till the end, it was all up to the local skateboarders themselves to show up to the meetings and say, hey, we need this. We know that we, there might not be funding for everything in this park. But if you're going to keep something in and pull something else out like the aquatic center that they wanted in here, 
because there were you know 60 80 skateboarders that showed up to that last meeting at council they approved it and a lot of that was led by local advocates like tommy barker who really just said we have to have this and they were driven they're like no we're not going to take no for an answer we got to do it the right way we got to have 20 people go up to the microphone and share why this park is needed for us skateboarders and that's the kind of template that we're trying to push for every project is like hey like if you want it done, you gotta really tell them why it should be here over an, another aquatic center that was way more expensive than the skate park. Uh, and you know, when the city cut the ribbon and they opened this thing up, they're like, wow, this is well worth the investment by looking at how many people are here every day, every weekend. It doesn't matter if it's 9 a.m. or right before dark, you're gonna see the same amount of people here all the time, which is awesome. That's what it's intended for. I had skateboarders accuse me uh, saying, man, you need to you need to double the features up in here. I was like, no, actually, we don't. In fact, I'm thinking about taking more out. You know what I mean? So, to have this space to to cruise, like this guy right here, he's setting up, pushing like a real street spot, just to hit like a bump to a ledge, which is reminiscent of the old OG LA schools, a bump to the benches. Why not have all that in there and make it feel like you're at a real street spot? And because of that, I think it's become really successful and having people come from all over the world saying. We gotta come here, we wanna experience this. Because what I've learned is that it's the environment and the way people feel when they come into a skate park just as much as what they're riding in it. So if you feel like you're comfortable here, you belong here, this is something that comes from us, you're more than likely to enjoy it more and you're gonna take care of it more. Even the bull, I've had people from other countries say, hey, I need the plans for that park, we need to copy that bull. We rode it, everyone likes it, it's a perfect crossover, it's not too uh, shallow, not too deep, very friendly. Uh, for people who are just learning, but also fun enough for people who are seasoned vets, you know? People don't realize that most skate park developing companies can come up with anything. They'll all be different flavors, different styles, but they'll come up with something that's probably going to be pretty good. But the difference is, how do you get it approved by the entire community so that they they embrace it and they don't fight against it the whole time? We actually even made this um, the proper width for wheelchair access. So again, we actually did an accessible plan for the project, which you could come in from any level that's considered ADA accessible. And technically, to get from one side to the other, we had to make this a certain kind of a width to get around to if they really, oh, I'm sorry, it's actually on the bottom here. There's a little pathway on the bottom here that actually had to be wide enough to get all the way around to the other side. And for some of you who have seen skateboarding in San Diego, you might notice some people skating in the wheelchairs. Uh, you know, like, like Robert Tompkins, you know, and like some of those guys who really need to be thought about where they actually do want to ride around in here. Just like to cruise through one spot to the next in a, in a skate park, it's nice to be able to go through the whole park and not have to even hit your tail if you don't want to. So here we are, we're, we're coming around. This is actually coming around the outside, backside of the skate plaza. You can see it right here. Here's the walls and the fencing. Uh, you know, we needed to have just to keep the ADA accessible elevations here. And, uh, you know, here's the pavers, you know, where you're not trying to have a bunch of people doing high speed craziness out here and trying to keep, you know, the majority of the skate action in here. And this is kind of cool because when we found out that they really wanted this to be its own zone because of the elevation challenges and, and accessibility, we're like, okay, let's make this feel like you're going into a special place. You know, you got these pillars. And again, all the fencing is very curved, which kind of matches that artistic element of Encinitas itself. Even the, the color of the walls, the color of the pavers, these are all earth tones that you'd find in Encinitas. So they were all very intentional. And so, you know, coming in here, like, look, let's just make it a cool little bull zone. You know, where it's got some thing, you know, if, this is so that like supposedly someone who doesn't know they're entering a skate area, it's like, okay, you're intentionally entering in a skate area so if grandma falls into the bowl, she can't sue the city. And I got to tell you, there has been a grandma who's fallen into a bowl. It happens. I will say this, that there was a challenge with this bowl because a lot of the locals really wanted another deep bowl, 10 foot, 11 foot. And knowing how we were approaching the street plaza to be more crossover for a lot of different people, we knew there was already some deep bowls in San Diego. Like, look, how do we have a bowl that's not super deep, super challenging, so that kids can learn how to ride it, street skaters could ride it. And that was really what set up these dimensions. I definitely got plenty of hate mail and hate messages from the OG pros that said, this is terrible. You know, this is not deep enough, steep enough. 
And but over time, I think they've appreciated having a fun bowl, which we just didn't have out here in San Diego. And so how does this complement the street plaza is the same way, just making sure that even the blends in the hips are a little bit more friendly and that the clover wasn't so gnarly like the old turf park where it's bucking you off your board. So it's really making the waterfalls and the blends between each hip work better so you can pump and keep your speed and not get bucked off. And to be able to come here and see some of the OGs like the Lance Mountains and the Steve Caballeros really have fun in here and you know get their board slides on and really pump and still be able to do some decent airs in here is awesome all the way to the to next generation young bucks doing you know super high airs out even the girl movement is huge i see them here all the time in groups shredding and really pushing the limit and learning some cool stuff on here then taking it to the bigger bulls the bigger vert ramps and then just even providing this kind of stadium seating in here that was a compromise for having to drop the bull all the way down for ADA accessibility was, well, if we're gonna have to do that, let's make some cool seating, natural looking walls here for people to hang out, sit down, have events here, which they have, which have been really cool. I know they had the All A Girl Exposure event here years ago, and I, I feel like there's probably easily a thousand people in here. So we shrunk the flat and we made it more of an elliptical blend from the transition to the bottom. So one of the things that you'll find different on this bull and a lot of the bulls that we do is specifically this one because there's so many pockets and so many blends in this clover that you'll see that there's actually a seam right there. It's just a line, a joint. A lot of the bulls will actually have a legitimate flat bottom there, but we actually got rid of that and just blended it so they had more blend and more speed. And it just really keeps you moving in the bull a lot better than having to hit a transition to flat and then back up and then to flat. Like you don't really want to have to readjust all the time. You just want to flow through it and, and do it almost like a pool instead of a, a skate bowl. You know, that's the difference. So I'll hand it off to all the OGs, you know, the Lance Mountains and everyone we got, you know, input from over the years, the Chris Millers, even, you know, people like Salba over the years, you know, talking to us about the bulls, what they liked, what they didn't like, how it should work how the OG skate park bowls were and how the backyard pools were. How do we find that perfect balance of designing that on paper and then actually making it be built that way, which was a huge challenge. The contractors, I could tell you right there, in the very center where all those pockets intersect, there's kind of a triangular section in there, right where that little kid just rolled away from. That whole area was the most challenging trifecta where everything came together and that was, that was the toughest day of pouring for them, it was just getting that all to work. So again, like you said before, it's working with the contractors to help them understand what you're trying to accomplish. Do you have any questions? Do you get what we're trying to do here? You have to check the templates and the shape of it all before they actually put the concrete in, otherwise it's too late. But we verified the shape and the blends and the rebar all ready to go and like, okay, that's it shape it to that and we're good and then the whole time you're like <laughs> please like let's hope it turns out you never know yeah. knowing that the street plaza was something the advocates said the skaters who lived here said look we don't have a street plaza everywhere else in the country is getting plazas we're not because we already have all these other parks so if la is getting them you know all these other areas you know pop plaza but we need something like that here but we know that transition skateboarding we have a heritage of that here but instead of having two or three bulls, can we just have one really good one? But let's have a crossover bull so that kids who are skating street can come down in here and skate here and actually have fun and enjoy themselves. But then, like you said, you know, other little kids can learn, but then the pros who know how to ride that and really want to get buck in here can. So right here, we're standing in uh, the area where we have the seating block walls. So there was a landscape architecture firm that we've worked with before for the overall park. So there was definitely like an overall kind of overarching theme for the whole park, but we wanted to somehow, how do we transition the skate park, the skate plaza area to the rest of the park? And I wanted to design these seat blocks in here integrated into the grassy area that created that kind of natural seating amphitheater feel to hang out 
watch people in action at the skate park. And sometimes we know what kind of maybe even fits better to transition that into the other area for the other parts of the project that the landscape architects are doing. It's one thing I really had to kind of just literally draw in myself because I knew we needed it. And it kind of played off the geometry of the skate plaza. Going back to what I used to see at the Embarcadero in San Francisco, having people hanging out, eating lunch, watching, enjoying the space. You don't even have to be a skateboarder to do that. And that's really why we put this in here kind of to help again make this feel like a cool environment that's not about just the skateboarding itself but about a place you actually want to be at no matter if you're skateboarding or not. This next topic might be a little controversial uh, because ultimately you want to have skateboarders involved with designing a skate park and even building a skate park. You want to know that the people you're working with understand you and the culture of skateboarding and the train that we ride every day whether it's in the streets, whether it's emulating something in a backyard pool. Bottom line is you kind of need to understand how that works and how that really flows together. To have a successful skate park, you may have a combination of skateboarders and very technical professionals. You want someone who's a good civil engineer to make sure that what you're designing is actually going to drain and have water get out of the skate park. Because I'm looking around at some of our skate parks these days and I see water coming through the bottom of bowls. I see lifting and heaving because no one did the proper investigation for soils engineering. So it really does take a village to get a skate park to happen. Definitely takes a village to making sure that you're designing and following through all the way till the construction is finished. And then working with the crew on the ground who's grinding and putting in the work to actually build these projects. You really need to have a combination of people who really understand the skateboarding culture and the terrain, but also as people who are going to be involved that aren't necessarily, necessarily skateboarders, but who are just really good at what they do. And you just need to identify those critical pieces and areas of that team. It's like a skateboarding team. You need to have that team that can jump in a van and ride together for a time and work together to create something really cool. And in that van, you might have a filmer, you might have a team manager, who knows who you might have in there, but everyone adds to that to that piece of that success of that team. Same thing with developing these projects. You just have to find the right people who, some of them might just be a really kick-ass carpenter. They're just really good at dealing with form work. You might have someone who may not really be super savvy in skate parks, but really knows how to weld really well. So how can you use that guy and have it led by someone who understands the skateboarding world but making sure you're using someone who's just really good at building. So there's, there's a give and take there, and you just have to find the right balance that works for every team. Started this project around, I think, the beginning of 2016, and it opened at the end of 2017, right before Christmas. Nice little Christmas presents uh, for the residents there. So this one was a little unique in the fact that the city had on-call design teams already sort of in, in the queue and the prime landscape designer uh, Schmidt Design Group already had the contract for this so they, the city had engaged us to work with them to do the skate park portion and then they were really responsible for making sure it's all kind of fitting in here dealing with the constraints of the walkway, the ball field, making sure we had netting up here, um, coordinating all the grading and drainage, and we have some nice some cool like swales and bio basins over here. So really is working with them to fit it all in here. Really my job is really focused on the skatable features. I mean, we really actually work together as a team to really think about this big arrival. How do you transition from something that's passive into active? How do you deal with these seating benches, the seating walls, like the details with the nice rock formations to match the playground, which they also worked on. Working on the fencing alignment and really how you come in here in the arrival and really working with them and the community on this M feature right here. So like, how do we do something in here that really says, you know, mid-city? And that was the youth advocacy group that really fought hard to get this project as well as the one over the bridge. Um, they were all kind of working simultaneously to provide something here for the youth, which they clearly didn't have and they needed. So like, how do we do something that celebrates the youth? And they told us what they wanted. You know, we want some transition. We want definitely a nice bowl, but we definitely want some nice street stuff because that's what we skate in our neighborhoods. The parameters and the footprint of the actual skate park were really set up, I think, more by the city. And so, you know, some people ask why have it, you know, next to these tight, you know, hillsides or why have it next to a ball field. 
sometimes they tell you where it needs to go and you just make it work. And in this situation, that's what happened. Like we had a kind of bottlenecked central area which we decided to make the entrance. And then really in the areas that started to flare out and get wider, that's where we put more of the active um, area in. If we hadn't done that M feature right there, I was worried about cross flow. If we hadn't have done that, it probably would have been more like stacked ledges or other kind of plaza kind of style elements that you would be able to hit in a line. But since I was really worried about this being the narrowest part of the skate park, cross flow and everything else, we had the little curb bench in here. We had the big M feature with the bank. And then on either side, you had like a flat bar and, and some ledge, you know, kind of the little uh, handrail stuff. So we wanted to make sure there's room because we learn and we listen from previous parks about, oh, it's too tight, it's too bottlenecked, there's no room. Yeah, like if you're designing something and you have a hillside, the first thing you try to think about is how can I put something in a hillside if you can? So we wanted to think about putting just some kind of monstrous signature feature that could be seen from anywhere and try to like take advantage of the hillside and tuck it in there. And that's what we did. The hardest part though, was having something popping out of that bank. That was really, really hard for the contractor to build. And they, they had to do it. It took them three times to actually pull that off. They had to demo this out twice because they couldn't really figure out the sequencing and how to blend it into the top. Then we had to deal with the drainage. Where does the water go when it hits the top of the coping? We wanted to have the curb on top in case someone wanted to get crazy and try to do something on a curb going up and down this thing, which I've seen, which is awesome. Honestly, what you really want to do in a skate park is create something that can be adapted to. You don't know how it's going to be used. You don't know if it's going to be embraced or who can do what on it. But if you just create the opportunity, that's really what the goal is, is to create an opportunity for people to do stuff that you would never even imagine being able to be done on a, on a skate park. But it's like, you know, sometimes you, you think about it, it's like, should we have done it? Was it too difficult? And that's the challenge is if you're not talented enough to design something and explain it, then we probably shouldn't be designing it. That's my thought process is like you, you should be challenged enough to be able to figure out how to show it in a drawing, in a perspective view, in a model, whatever it is, how to do it, even show the sequencing. If you can't figure out how to make that work, if you can't do that, then it probably doesn't need to be done because you're not basically good enough to figure out how to make it work. I mean, that's my opinion. Right here, we're on top of the uh, zone where we got the little kind of mini flow bowl over here, I like to call it. It's like a little dish. The whole concept was you have a wider piece of the skate park on one side, you have a narrow section in the middle, which lent itself to be more of a street skating lane, and then a bigger area at the end. So my thought process was, how can we transition zones on both sides that are different, that can sort of create staging areas so that people who want to skate the street lane have a place to kind of drop in, roll, and get speed to go through the whole thing. Like, could you get like a no push line based on the speed you're generating from dropping in on this side or that side? And the other challenge is, uh, you know, putting in again, something here that could maybe be kind of cool, different. Can you roll over this from inside or outside and use it as an opportunity to get some speed or clack an ollie over? I mean, I was thinking like, you know, transfers into the zone, maybe even transfers this way out of this into here, which I've seen happen, which is awesome. Some people use it as like a cool little flip bank right here. And then the other thing was, is that as you can see on the side right here, all the way down this lane, we had again the hill. So I was like, okay, at some point, the hill was higher than the skate park. So we're gonna put like a ledge across this whole thing? Or could we put something else that could be like a tight tranny or a tight bank that could be kind of different that could contain the dirt but be skatable? A lot of times I'm kind of like not, a, not for cross flow, but I figured if it was tight enough and quirky enough, it wasn't gonna generate like people just literally doing quarter pipe tricks all day long and just running to people all day. Where it's more skated like going down the line, um, that was the thought process and just remembering the videos from back in the day. At the time I was wrapping up this whole thing, this was like the last thing I think we designed was that little quick training right there. And I was actually talking to Colby Carter about it and he reminded me of the cool like Arizona little quick tranny thing to the fence and there's one like that in Berkeley. And so we're like, yeah, let's make a kind of the Berkeley banks or that one spot in AZ where you had that quick tranny. We don't have a gate uh, fence behind it, but that was a thought process was just make some cool, tight and quirky. So like, that's what's so cool. Like even the bowl, you know, we were thinking about the bowl and all the shapes he could do. It was like, okay, everyone's done a death box. Everyone's done a light. 
and one of the guys on the design team was talking about doing something like the Paula pool where you actually do like a like a notched out love seat and I was like that's awesome do something different and it actually has some like heritage um, that speaks to like San Diego skaters now obviously it's not the Paula pool but it was inspired by right just having that notch in there um, we wanted to make it feel like a pool and not just a bowl so that's where I kind of worked on making the bottom as elliptical and, and flowy and transitional as possible instead of like a transition to flat and having it banked to the drain you just wanted to make it feel like you could like really carve around the whole thing and not get pitched or get thrown off because uh, something was like blending in a weird way so it's all about balancing right like taking inspiration from different pieces you know the the Berkeley banks or the AZ spot you know some street spots um, Paula pool whatever it is you just take in all these inspirations and just sort of tweak it and make it work for this actual park if you can take something that's similar on another project because a lot of people tell me how much they like City Heights a lot of people tell me how they love Poots Park or even like the bull at Poots Park so it's like okay that's great let's take that thought process and make something a little bit different that fits your park because really what's gonna help define the space is the shape so like no other skate park is probably ever gonna have this shape where it's like narrow in the middle two circles at the end you got a ball field you got this I mean it might happen um, but ultimately usually the footprints and the shapes and the parameters the grades how they slope away that always kind of helps like okay this park we're gonna have to tear us down a little bit can't be flat or this park we have to have something a little bit higher on one side and something at the end to push you you know push you back up the park so those little things always make you make them different a little bit every time based on the parameters and the side and the conditions because you want to work with the grade you don't want to work against it and so that kind of helps make these all a little bit different every month it's like can we get the city highs bowl no <laughs> like, well we can you can but like let's make it a little bit different you know i like certain things about a lot of parks i've worked on i try to not get too attached to them because you want to be able to expand and do different things all the time and if you really marry to one thing so much every time you do a new design you're always going to go back to that first if you look down the line right here right behind the wall you have like different sort of like rock formations and kind of a swale that actually like kind of helps treat the water before it goes into any kind of a drain and all the drains whether you see them at the bottom of the bowls or in the street course go into a big drainage basin at the very end of the park on the opposite end so we had to basically size a skate park to allow for a really big drainage basin area where all the water from the park can go into that basin and actually infiltrate there and therefore keeping it more sustainable and natural so yeah are you giving up some potential skatable space for drainage kind of but that's really what you kind of have to do if you want to be responsible and making sure that this park works and doesn't flood, gives it a place for the water to go. It's almost like going to your regular grocery store and buying regular produce. Now when you're doing a project to say, it's like, you know what, we want to go organic. So now this is like the next level of designing for kind of organic produce in a way. And it does it cost a little bit more money, does it take up a little bit more space, infrastructure, absolutely. But that's what cities and agencies really want to see. And so we've adopted that model and allowed for all those things to come into play because a lot of places required and it's just number two is the right thing to do. I wrap up the bowl zone and again the cool thing is you can see this whole lane right here from up here at the higher elevation. Um, well the reason why it is a little bit higher over here is because we were trying to give the bowl more room to go into the ground for drainage. Ultimately it still wasn't deep enough so for those of you who may not know this there's actually a, a sump pump this drains into a concrete vault that goes really deep and if it fills up with water a sump pump will electrically kick in pump the water out into the drainage basin behind the bowl at the end of the skate park this is really really a big deal in southern california and for other parks and other parts of the country i found a lot of skaters don't really care about this but in southern california people who ride bulls want their bull zone they don't want someone doing a trick up the step up, shooting their board and having to go right into a bull and hit someone in the head while they're skating the bull. So in every single park, especially in Southern California, I always make sure to have what I we would call like bull protection. And if you can make it like a skate feature and not just have it be a wall, that's ideal. So for this one, 
we knew people are coming and going up the street lane they're going to be coming up this to the bull zone full speed so how can we do like a quick little tight tranny so if your board does go full speed it'll actually kind of go up and not over and right into the bowl but that's the whole thing is like make this cool little kind of like pseudo seat wall opportunity to have a buffer from the bowl but on the other side you can make it skatable it was really never meant to be like a skate ledge people are going to skate it of course as a ledge um that was really the thought process on this and then if you want just a normal seat wall you got the ones on the side here with a uh, you know, just regular concrete cap with stone veneer. Again, it matches the theme of the whole park and the playgrounds over there. We're like, how do we make the bull feel like the rest of the skate park in the park? And if you can get some close-ups on it, you can see that the tile here is tan, black, and reds. And so this tile is really unique, but it feels like City Heights. And every time I see clips here, I was like, oh, that's City Heights, because I know the color of the tile. Um, this is a Zach Dowdy exclusive. Um, I I have had people like meet up with me here or other skate parks or whatever and I'll just get the most randomest comments of like thank you for designing these bowls they came out great but by the way how in the hell is a street skater <laughs> who is not known for riding transition bowls designing bowls like this and I was like dude I just became a student of uh, bowl skating I asked a lot of questions I went in and studied a lot of bulls that were, you know, being ridden and was considered were very well done. And I tapped a lot of the OG pros who grew up skating bulls all the way from the 70s on what makes a good bull. So I just, I was a really, um, I was just a good student and I studied and studied and studied, you know, the architecture and design of how to make a good bull. And believe me, they all didn't turn out great. There were definitely failures. You learn from your failures. And even every time I do another bowl, it's terrifying because, again, in this situation, because of the constraints we had, there's only so big I can make the bowl. Probably one of the shortest bowls I've ever done. Like, in short, meaning that the distance from where you drop in right here to go down that waterfall to hit the deep end is not that much room. So, some of the biggest critics of bowl skating and anything I've ever worked on was here riding one day. And I asked them what they thought, and they said, no, it's perfect. And I was like, it's not too short. They're like, no, it's great. Do more like this. So again, you never know. I've been told by a lot of other skateboarders that they really like this bank more than any other bank because of the angle. They really like the way it kicks you up. You can still go out. I mean, you can fly as far as you want to. But for some reason, this bank and the angle of the bank really worked well to just do a lot of tricks like over trash cans and you got this guy doing this barrier which is like chest high over here. So like even the ability to kind of jump this high off of that um, and still be able to kind of skate down it is really cool. I'll even take my phone and I'll actually like kind of like check the angles of banks and compare a lot of different banks. Even stuff I haven't designed like check it and compare and see like what is the angle and what works and what doesn't work based on you know um, rider input and so i guess we can go kind of check this one out and you know i mean even if it's like just for an example like even if we're checking the angle on this hubble ledge it's like okay that's 18 degrees that's actually about as steep as i would ever go on a on the angle of a ledge or a handrail is about 18 degrees if possible bank and it's 25 degrees which is interesting because i think if i go over here it's probably different <laughs> Now, now flip, flip the script on me. You see it? It's about, it's, it's about 24. I try not to go steeper than a 23, so it turned out to be 24. Maybe that's through construction. But again, you find out that sometimes those banks are a little bit steeper, really do throw you up pretty nice. You know, this trash cans, they live here all day long. Trash cans, cones. Now we got these big barriers, street signs. It's interesting how people like try to bring stuff in from the outside to try to make it feel more authentic. Like when you see this, it's like, oh, it feels like kind of a street clip, like a street spot, like, could you actually film a clip here and kind of have it be acceptable for a street part? Possibly just for the context and way it was delivered, the street sign with the graffiti and everything, it kind of feels more authentic. And we try to make all our parks feel authentic. So the way you use it is up to you, but. Let's create a cool little weird hip that's very interpretive, right? Like expect the unexpected on something like this where maybe you're just using it to kick, turn and carve over. Maybe you're doing some cool tricks. It's really up to the skateboarder on how they want to use it. Maybe they just want to roll next to it and just like to look at it like an architectural, sculptural piece of the park. It's almost like an art form. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And so, yeah, so like, 
creating some abstract options, functional art, however you want to label it. It's good to have some things in there that just look a little bit different. So again, you know that this is Escondido and not another random skate park. This is a uh, 7,000 square feet. So not big, but I think, I think again, it's like, what do you do with the space? Good things can come in small packages. How do you scale everything appropriately so it's not too big, too small? Um, the heights are really critical, like this A-frame. You just don't want it to be too high, too low. You just have to have the angle just right so you can pop over it. You can pop onto the hub ledge. You can actually hit this and carve and cruise over this quarter pipe. Um, I think it's just, that's what I feel skate parks and skate spots should really have in there is just the ability to have fun and not always feel like you're training for like the X Games or like the Olympics or something like that. It's, it's more of like, how can you show up to a spot, have fun with your homies and still do what you want to do. You know what I mean? That's, that's really the intent of this whole project. Little hip we, hip we made off of this, so it lines you right up for that quarter pipe. Got a pump up in here so you can pump over and hit the quarter pipe. But we really just wanted to add a little pocket in there because once again, we know we couldn't do a bowl. We're not doing anything huge in here, but can we create something interesting in here for the dudes who really like to skate trannies like a bowl, right? So if we can put a little pocket in there and kind of keep it fun and interesting so people like Wes can hit it on his little mini board, <laughs> then that's, that's what we're trying to do, you know what I mean? It's, it's just to be able to kind of have a pocket and a flow that actually you can do something on to push you back into the park. If you want to do a run or a line, you can skate this and hit the little corner pocket, go over the pump up and it pushes you right back down the lanes. So you can go back to the tranny lane, a little bit more high speed. You can go to the more tech lane, which is more technical with ledges and flat bars, more pushing and more street style kind of skating. So you kind of like, it's almost like a video game, like choose your lane, you know what I mean? Like you want the flowy, tranny version or you want the more street flat bar ledge version we're trying to keep options open even in a small space like this you got options and that's what's kind of cool is I think the challenge is trying not to put too much in a space and trying to make it be everything to everybody because you know you can't do that on any project but when you have a small space you know you just got to scale it the way you have to um, it's just making sure you're not trying to overdo it and put too much in it's almost like hey let's actually start taking stuff out so, because you just don't have a whole lot of room to say, well, maybe that didn't turn out okay, but you still got this, all this other stuff in the park. It's really about, no, like everything matters. The flat bar matters, the bank to curb matters, everything matters. Um, and it should matter for every park, but especially when you got less in here, it has to really be on point so that everything is really done well.